The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. programming on devices ranging from simple PDAs to working on crazy supercomputers. He has been involved in Linux kernel development since 1999, and from 1999 to 2004, he was the kernel maintainer for the frame buffer layer. He also was active in the early input API work. Okay. In the last year, he's become active in the work of the new TMS APIs and the VRI layer, and he's currently developing for the Unicorn, Unichrome XORG VRM driver. And he's here to talk to us today about KMS and TPM gem driver development. With the Open Chrome project. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Thank you for coming to this talk today. Um, one of the things that's going on in the last couple of years in Linux development is this new API layer. As we all know that the frame buffer layer was developed a few years ago, but it had some shortcomings. So a whole new layer was developed to do memory management and handle modern architecture of, video, uh, of graphics hardware. The, the thing is, is there's no documentation or anything like that, and there are very few drivers that exist that show you how to do it. Basically, the Radeon and the NVIDIA chipset. Uh, there is actually another, and as well as the Intel chipset. Well, there's a fourth chipset that's in the market that's very common in the Asian markets, and that's the VIA chipset. And so the problem is in there, it's lagging the development. About in about January, I got a motherboard that actually had this chipset, and when I set it up, I was doing it for other types of development. Uh, it didn't work. So at this point, I decided to actually make it work. And this is the experiences I had at this, and I'm giving this talk so that other people who are looking at the, right now the embedded market is looking to port things like OMAP and other drivers to this layer, but there's a lot of mystery about how it actually works and what it does. So this is my experiences with the Open Chrome project on this. Okay, we all know the history of the Linux stack. It's, it was start, when Linux first started out, it was a, basically an x86, i386 system, and it used VGA text console mode only. And uh, the graphics stack was basically the x386 drivers, which were all user mode space based. Well, and that drive, and the xorg free, was designed such that it could operate on many operating systems. Also around the early days, the Mesa stack was also started by Brian Paul. Now at this time they were all separate projects, and this was in the days when you could bring up your Linux system and it would work fine, and the XORG systems, if you didn't tune it right, it would take out your system. Well, by the mid-90s, the first ports to Linux to non-Intel platforms started to happen, and what we began to see is that the VGA, this text hardware mode, doesn't exist on these other platforms. So what they realized that they had a, they were pixel-based uh, systems, so they realized they had to create console systems for this, and out of this came the frame buffer console layer to handle. It was the M68Ks and the Dalk Alphas that first came out. But at this, even though with this development, the X-Free86 org drivers still existed and didn't use it too much later, well, in 1999, I got involved with this, actually, this work, because, as I said, it, none of it were, I had issues with getting things like the X386 driver working on my system, and so, and it lacked the performance at that time, and a lot of support for a lot of hardware. So I started working on that, and I got involved in the frame buffer API layer, and discovered that it, because it was so text-based console, a lot of the systems were intertwined and it made development driver writing extremely difficult. And because of the difficulty, often very few drivers were written. So I set out to rewrite the API to make it extremely simple to write it. And so that's what happened there, and that became, it became separated out 
At the same time, another solution was developed called DRI, which was aimed at handling the 3D engines, which didn't want to deal with any of the mode setting stuff to make the X386 org drivers more portable. Well, as time moved on, about 2000 and so, in the industry, we began to see the embedded system, and we began to see changes in the embedded system that also started to leak over into laptops. We've seen the development of DVI, also of HDMI, and other APIs coming from the consumer electronics world to the laptop and the desktop systems. Because of these changes, a lot of the standard models of what we had in the, the frame buffer layer was, is become deprecated. So we had a new APIs had to be developed. The old model was one analog CRT display. You had your video RAM on the bus. And in those days, I, if you're an old timer, you'll remember there were 64K of windows that you had to flip with the memory to do the super VGA modes. And then you had the FIFO or the DMA to move it over the bus. Today, we have many display outputs you can do simultaneously. You can clone the displays. Also, the system memory, at one time, the embedded platform developers realized that video memory is expensive. So they realized that they wanted to take s memory from the system and actually used it. So the old idea of dedicated video RAM on the bus began to break down. And, that, and, and also, to, but to address that system memory, they, they developed an, a system called Graphics Addressing Remapping Table. I don't know if any of you have ever worked with um, types of NAND cards or flash drives. It has a similar idea of mapping so you know where things are on the system as they move around. And as time also moved on, you began to see more graphics pipes where you could pipeline graphics commands into the system, executing several at a time. Hot plug support, if your monitor fell out in the old days, you never got it back. Today, it can detect if it's in there and you plug in a new monitor, it can adapt to it. You get and one of the biggest developments today is the, uh, the use of shaders. Um, for people who aren't familiar with it, today they began to realize they, can't, they took the idea of, of jitters from Java, which was pre-compiled bytecode, and that you could eject it into these GPU units and render things. And they found this to be much more flexible than the old style of fill a rectangle, copy an area. So shader technology has also came into Okay, so this is the basic driver core for the DRM layer. It's wrapped around, like all Linux drivers, it uses the PCI driver, which you have your PCI D uh, tables that tell you what the devices are. And of course, you name your driver, so it shows up in sysfs and things like that. This is uh, pretty, these are pretty standard things that you will always do for writing a core driver with minimum features. Um, KMS also provides a probe and remove function for this. Um, in the old days, the reason for this was because the frame buffer layer existed and the DRI layer existed at the same time, but only one device structure, PCI driver, can be mapped to a device, a, a driver structure at a time. So because of this, the DRI layer did not really register the device. But that ha now, that, now that has changed with the emulation of the frame buffer layer in the DRI layer, you can actually register it with the PCI layer. And these are the commands that you do it with, DRM, PCI init, and exit. And you get the, there are actually parent functions on the embedded platform as well, as DRM platform init and DRM platform exit. Um, the core structure, once you have your regular PCI driver up, the core structure is the struct DRM driver. And this is where it sets up for the, the things to handle to open the device on the DRI. You have things like, you have hooks in there for the load and the unloading, which brings the driver up and takes it down. You have the fill ops for the memory maps, for the close and the opening of the DRI. If you look in slash dev, you'll see a DRI zero file. Um, you also have other hooks in there for things like first open, last close. These were things where if, for example, if, the le if your X server toppled over, it would clean up after itself. You also have uh, 
an important thing called the driver features, and that's your flags. Does it support DMA? Does it support mode setting? And those things will tell you, and you will use those features uh, throughout the driver to know what to do. An uh, example of the Open Chrome project, we did a, we did, we are supporting both KMS and non-KMS at the same time, so that way we don't smash the X org drivers, which are accessing the registers and doing the mode setting in user land still. There are also IOCTO hooks, that's for if you want to do your own, what, whatever commands you want to do. Some drivers do blitz, some do, uh, the most common use in our case is to do memory allocation. We also do video blanking handling. That's for the case to syn for synchronization. They will send you an event when, an ev when the, the tracer reaches the end. And of course we have IRQ handling. And for to handle things like when the DMA engine is completed its task and other things, such as ha hot plug is often handled by IRQ. Now in graphics, in graphics hardware there are two problems that have to be solved. One is the memory management, and the other is, the, is dealing with the mode setting itself, setting up the display. So in the system, as you can see in, the, in your regular system, you have your CPU, and you have your cache, and your main memory, and you, has your, you have your IOMMU, and your IO bus. Usually in a video card that has dedicated, like say, video memory, it's on the IO bus. And for your modern systems, you have your main memory, but as I was saying before, you can have hardware systems which use some of the main memory as if it was the video memory. So that's where the IOMMU comes from, it maps that. In fact, that's where that GART that I discussed earlier for the mapping, that's its job is to point those two together. So that way, you don't have the penalty of going with, so it becomes visible to the card for in its bus space. Now on x86, the bus address space and the main space is actually equal. But that's not usually, that is not true on other platforms. Anyone who's ever worked with a MIPS or an ARM would really, they've come across this issue. Um, and as I was saying earlier, in the, some of the early embedded systems and laptops, such as uh, the sys chip would use the main memory instead of any video RAM that's devoted. And uh, remember those 64K pages? This is another reason why you need memory management. Well, today the PCI bars only expose 256 megabytes of space to the system at any one time. So you have to shuffle your memory around since modern video cards will have two, even four gigabytes of RAM on them. So th in order to solve the memory management problem, there was two solutions that ended up becoming that had to come to the, to the forefront. Actually, first was TTM, and later Intel said that it was too complicated. So they decided to make their own, and they called it GEM. And they both have their strengths and their weaknesses. For the Open Chrome project, we realized actually the best solution was to use both. You can actually, ge quote, GEMify the TTM layer. Um, as you can see, the pros of the gem layer is it's a pretty simple and minimum API. It's designed to, such that you can do what you want to do in, the, in a lot of ways without being bounded to very restrictions. And the TTM layer is very restrict in what its requirements are. Yeah, um, the other thing that's nice about the gem layer is it's, you can actually make it swappable. It has a shem uh, layer to it that you can back back all the devices so when you do a, um, when you power down your system, you can actually, for hibernation, it'll actually save it to regular memory. Um, it actually, I find, I, my, in my personal opinion, uh, GEM actually works better for user land interfaces. It has a better uh, interface for that. It has a, ha a concept of a handle which is basically a f like a file descriptor. So you can perform operations on the GEM device on the gem memory allocation. And it also, gem is designed to try to avoid uh, mapping these buffers into user, uh, user space. It uses read and write calls, which is, I, I found to be a somewhat of a drawback. And then they have this concept of domains and relocations. 
and the reason they have this, domains is basically where do you want to grab your memory pool from, this concept. And this, is, this ha infects the way the caching is different on the video memory on board versus the system memory. So in domains, you can specify if you want to grab it from the AGP memory or from the video or from the system. It allows you control. It also allows you to select, try to grab from all three based on what the best criteria is. There's also the concept of relocations, which basically is moving your memory around depending on the situation. Consider you only have X amount of RAM and you start doing memory pressures for say texture maps. Some of it has to be swapped out and you're gonna have to grab it from a different place. Um, so that's the gem API. The other layer is the, called the translation table maps layer. And as I said, it's a much, it's a more complicated API, but it's a much, it's a very powerful API that does a lot for you. It has much, it, one of the strengths is it's much finer grain lock. Gem has the tendency to lock on a higher level. And the biggest benefit of the TTM layer is actually the concept of fences, which I will go over with you. Fences is a way to allow synchronization for memory to be moved around and things like that. Um, so I'm gonna first go over the TTM layer the, and how to set it up and to, do, and to build it. So when you do your driver, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna create this thing called a TTM bow device. It's, it's the global view of your, your physical device. And it contains, the, and it's basically a containment of all the address spaces you're gonna have and use, video RAM, system RAM, et cetera. It's also gonna be an array of memory managers. What you're gonna find is, is this memory manager will represent what memory you have. Do you have video RAM? Do you have AGP memory that's allocated to the side? Do you have PCIe scatter gather me memory? These things are set up in this structure and it tells you how much of it you have and other and uh, and it and how much you're using and it key, it's a tracker of the system. And the other importance inside that structure of course is your TTM bow driver. Your TTM bow driver is the the hooks for your personal device how to manage the memory. The so that's the structure you have to have inside your code there. You have you create one of these TTM bow devices and you register it through the TTM bow device init function. And this will bring it up for you. The, um, one of the things you will notice is it does this complex coding that most drivers kind of duplicated. In our project, we cr I created pretty generic code that can be shared by other drivers. Um, one of my goals is to m genericize a lot of the code so that way it's, driver writers want to be able to bring a driver up pretty quickly in the industry. Now, that dry, the bow driver contains a lot of structures for the memory management. The first one, of, and it's broken into different pieces. Uh, the first one is the TTM backend. This is the function that manages your, your guard and transferring your memory um, to your system between areas. It handles, uh, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things, for example, like scatter gather, it has a populate and a clear function. So you can get, you can allocate the scatter gather memory and uh, for usage for the driver. So that memory is set aside and allocated in a pool for you for optimization. And then from there, you can bind and unbind because the thing is, is you can allocate a huge pool, but you're not gonna, most, most buffers you're gonna allocate, you don't know how big they're gonna be. So the bind and unbind function allocates a segment in there and it binds the pages to them. So it does the mapping from the space. So when the video card looks at a texture that's been uploaded, it can look at it in its own space. And that's what the binding does, where you can write it to the system memory and you can access the system memory and it thinks it's in system memory. But the video card sees it as in, in video card memory when it's really not. The, we also have the mapping we also have the init mem type, and this is the mapping, the behavior of the, of the bus space um, for AGP VRAM. It sets things such as the caching. Caching is 
different for these um, properties. Um, for example, when you have VRAM and you memory map it to the system memory, uh, the problem is, is if you're writing to, say it's a DMA space, sorry, let me rephrase that. If it's DMA space, that doesn't mean, because it's done independent, say it's downloaded from the video card to the DMA space, the problem is it might not, it probably will not be updated in the cache in the CPU. So the memory will be out of sync of the CPU cache. So we, you have to be aware of this functionality and you have to do things such as invalidate the caches and that. So this is handled by that. And there's various flags for it too. Another thing is some, on some systems such as the, on video cards that have devoted video RAM, that memory is actually located in a specific area. It can be fixed. On some hardware, that memory is actually relocatable so it moves around. Uh, some DNA mappings can be created or destroyed at whim at various locations. So, so, that's, so that manages that, that structure. And then we have some functions in here that set this up. The init mem type is, is the method in, that, in the bow driver that sets up all these flags and that. Um, if you look at the Open Chrome project or the Radeon driver, you'll see examples. That can be pretty, made pretty generic, actually. I found it's mostly repetitive code. The IO mem reserve and the IO mem on reserve, those are functions. I don't know how many are familiar with kernel, um, kernel programming, but when you reserve a memory region, you grab that region so no other driver can uh, access it while you're using it and you can release it. That function has the same, it's actually a wrapper for that function around there. And in, that function takes this region, the TTM mem region tells you what region you want in that space. So you can do fine grain grabbing a certain X amount of, it's measured in pages. You will find that you can grab say page five from the AGP space to the 10,000th page. You can do this with this, this function. Also, this, this function also fills in, in the TTM bus placement. And that's all the bus information about where is the real memory from respective of the video card and from the system. So it tells you stuff like that. And then there's an, another function that is pretty much, n I've never seen anybody really do, is for memory mapping, it's, usually it's just an empty function. It's actually to test permission for when you do memory, when you mem map this to user space, these buffer objects, it can tell you what, per if you really have permission to access it. It's a method to, one of the goals is to be able to share buffers between applications. Right now, buffers, a lot, I, from what I've seen is most applications just allow their buffers to be shared everywhere. Yeah. So when you set it up for every type of memory region for the bow device, you're gonna use this TTM bow d device init and, oops, sorry. Uh, yeah, the, the bow driver has to be also registered separately as well. It's very similar to the bow device. There's just one of them for your driver. It's kind of similar to like the PCI driver structure and how it's registered. And you can also release it when you're done with the device when you unload the module. So those are only called once uh, when, the dry, when the module is loaded and when it's released. Now the function that's called also at that time is the memory regions itself, the TTM bow init memory ma uh, mm function and the TTM bow clean mm function. Those set up your memory regions. It goes over each one, such as your video RAM, and sets up the parameters and what it's, it sets it up for to be used and initialize it. So it's uh, usable to the driver. So those are the structures, but now we have to actually look at how do we use these structures. The way memory is handled is it's, it's pretty object oriented. And the reason for this is if you, in the old days of the XORG drivers, um, the, you had to allocate a chunk of video RAM and then you had to know where the offset was and you allocated a chunk for the cursor and then you allocated a chunk 
for the DMA queue, you would do things like this and you had to move all these pointers around to know where it is at any time and you had to, you had to basically do it all in the driver. This is to be able to just allocate a chunk of memory and you, it, it makes your life a lot easier not having to worry about where it's gonna move. It's just you have to be aware that the object can move on you uh, due to memory pressures and other things like that. So we have to be aware of that for the memory displacement. Now the first thing you'll notice is that when you do allocate a memory internally in the driver for a buffer allocation creation, you'll notice that the first place it's, it's created is quote in system memory. So when you actually go to use the driver, it's gonna displace the memory and it's gonna move it to its proper location. So in order to do this, you have to have things like the fault reserve notification function. That is a hook to when a page fall happens. Now, usually that's a very basic function, but remember how I was saying that you had these PCI windows of 256 mags? You actually use this function for when you are accessing the memory outside of that region, and then you have to actually swap around the RAM, uh, the mapping, so you can actually still use what, as much as you can so you have to look over the table, say who's not using their memory, swap it out, and swap the one you want into the PCI bar space. So, so that's one of them. And we also have a swap notify function. So that's for the people, who, for the people who want to write applications and have their texture map. Usually, in the old days, you would break down the, you would free these buffers and that before you go into hibernation, but now you can actually save them to swap. So you don't have to regenerate these images and things like that. So that's what the swap notification function is, a hook to it'll let you know we're about to swap. And then, so that's the, that's the problem for how to, what causes memory displacement. Uh, displacement. Where does the, what causes, what can make it move to different places? Now, there are functions to move the buffers around. You can actually force the moving of the buffers too if you, if you so desire. Um, usually it has to deal with tiling functions. Um, the move notify function is used to set up your tiling before a move happens. It's a hook to that. And the reason is tiling is a special way to format the data. Instead of a linear buffer, it formats it so it minimizes the cache line uh, misses to increase performance. But in order to do that, you have to arrange the memory such, or sometimes even program the memory, the register so that when it goes to memory, it sees it as that tiling format. The other thing is you have to deal with is evictions. Like, there are times when in modern games and, and modern systems, a lot of modern applications that are gonna really push the limits on how much memory they're gonna use. So in that case, the memory's gonna be moved and you're gonna have to deal with that and where are you gonna place that? So there might be times that your textures might be booted out of the video RAM. Where is it gonna go next? Will it be put in AGP? Will it be put in system memory? So those flags tell you what would you prefer? Because there's many options now. It's not like the old days of just dumping it to your system memory. So you have to, so this way it allows you control what is the best optimization. Um, in fact, um, we use, you can use that for the best, like for example, to move memory from the system to the video RAM, you often move it to the AGP space and then to the video RAM. So these eviction flags can be set up such that it controls that flow. The other function is the move function, which is actually a very large function. And it deals with this, how to move the memory from the DMA to system memory. What if you're moving from system memory to system memory? Sometimes you do that. So it controls and it allows you to do acceleration functions for that. And of course, after you're done moving the memory, you wanna do you want to invalidate the caches. As I was saying, it can become out of sync with the CPU cache. Okay, this is the core object for this system. This is what, 
usually internally the driver is going to allocate when a user requests a memory, a memory buffer. And it's called the TTM buffer object. It can, be it can be shared with other applications. It's created by the TTM bow init function. That's the function you'll call on your driver to do this. Usually you'll write an IOCTO function. It comes in, you specify parameters, what size it is, what tiling format. Um, do you want it, you can even specify what domains this, um, for example, the Intel driver does that. It says do, uh, grab it from the AGP or from the video RAM. So, so the, it, you can specify that it comes into this function. Now, the most important thing is this placement that I'm talking about. Where do you want it? Um, which memory pool to get it from? Some pool, and the way it's written, actually, there's this structure that you define. It's called the TTM placement buff, uh, structure. And this structure actually allows multiple placements. So, and the reason for this is because some buffers might be actually busy. So you might not be able to use that buffer right there, so you'd use the next best thing. It might be under memory pressure. Say you prefer the AGP space, but there's so many textures you don't have memory, so you need to have a fallback, because you don't want to just fail on the user. So in that case, you, you would have these other um, busy, these other flags, there's an array of flags in it that you can tell which one to use next. You can also, Another feature it has is the ability to select where in that pool you can do that. Normally, you don't set the which page to do the first, you can specify the first and the last page. Normally, you don't specify them. It'll pick wherever it feels is best suited. But you can actually fine grain it. Now, if you do that, you have to be careful. You lose the ability to do multiple pools to pick from because you might set a range that's outside of that pool. And it also handles another issue, which is very critical, and that's alignment handling. A lot of hardware is set up, for example, on our, um, our open Chrome on the VA hardware, you have to do 16-bit alignment for data transfer. There's no way around that. If you don't, the hardware gets confused. So you have to deal with alignment issues. Where do you put the, inside the page, where do you line to write the data? Where do you start? And of course, the other thing that you specify when you allocate is, of course, the size. Um, there are actually two structures, two variables for the size. You have normal size, which is your, your regular size, and then you have your ACC size. Um, and that size is actually to grab it from the system heap, your normal system memory. And the reason for that is it's actually useful for example, if a user LAN wants to uh, set up in the kernel system, you want to do a get, get users pages. It transfers the memory from user land to the kernel space so it can be used. And this can actually, that is actually used for that to allocate that heap. Um, also, who's going to use this? You have uh, TTM bow types. Uh, that, uh, that is basically in the TTM layer, you can, the user can allocate a buffer but so can the internal kernel driver allocate the buffer. Also, the buffer can be allocated inside the kernel driver, but can be mem memmapped to user space. But the reverse is also true. The user can allocate memory and then say, I want to use this to transfer memory to the, to the graphics card or to be used in some way. So you can also actually do that as well. The other, but of course, in, all, in doing all this and transferring memory around, you have the issues of interruptibility. Do you want to wait? It might be busy, the, the, the graphics card, the DMA engine might be busy. So, or is it interruptible? Can this actually, can you, when you do finally send it up, do you want to cut it off? Can it be interrupted? Or does it have to stall the engine until it's completed? Some hardware can't handle data being sent up and then it stops. And of course, if you're using a gem backend, you have your swap space, which can actually be passed to the TTM layer as a, so it allows it to be interoperable. Okay. And our, uh, you will find that there are a lot of pointer structures with the TTM placement that um, most drivers do this fancy allocation. I realize that it's actually extremely 
complicated and you can do lots of memory leaks. So in, our, in the Open Chrome project, we developed an, a, a function that will allocate the, the memory and keep track of it for you for the placements. So you don't have to worry about string arrays of integers that defines flags. So now that we've created it, the next thing to do is we have to deal with its actual usage. Um, like any object, since it's shared between, it can be shared between applications, and even in the future, they want to be able to share this memory actually with different devices. This is one of the goals of the project. So, but in order to do that, of course, we have to be able to reserve it. So we have a reserve and unreserve function. So basically, it's a locking mechanism to make sure. And of course, that locking mechanism, there's a lot of different behaviors that can be defined. You can see, um, for example, if you grab it, can you sleep on that function? Sometimes if you're writing and the scheduler goes out, do you, do you want to be able to sleep? And if it is sleeping, do you want to be able to wake it up again? Do you want it interruptible? So, and also, do you want to do a no wait state? Sometimes you want to be able to just keep waiting until the DMA engine is ready or some other, and then if it isn't ready, you, ca you can return. So you can actually specify either to return or just to keep waiting. And we also have the sequence. Now, the first time you look at that, you go, what's the sequence? Well, sequence is actually, I don't know, it, you probably are familiar with the nice command. It gives you some, uh, some applications, to be, the preference over others. Well, you can actually do the same thing here. You can actually tell in the usage where do you want the reserve, if it's backlogged. Who gets first priority? You can control to some degree the priority. So now, you, now after you've set up your memory and you've reserved it, now the, another issue you're going to come with is sometimes you want to change the placement behavior as well. And that's the TTM bow validate function. This is for to move the data around. And it also deals also with the, you can also change the state to waiting and to interruptibility. So you can kind of think of the bow validate as a way to alter the behavior of the buffer object. You can actually see the examples of that in the, the set base. For example, um, I, if you do video panning, you grab a, a chunk of video memory and you tell the video card, this is the start of the memory, and you'll see that you can actually move it along. So this, we actually use the bow validate in that function to say, oh, it's scrolling. Here it is at this point now. Um, an and another function is also to make it non-evictable. Uh, as I was saying before, you can have things go out to swap uh, there are times when you do not want your stuff to go out to swap. That would be extremely bad. If, for example, your video memory. You don't want to go out to swap that's being displayed on your console under memory pressure. Otherwise, your screen would disappear and you would scratch your head. Okay. Now, one of the other nice functions that we have internally in the driver is the kmap and k_onmap function. This allows you to I/O remap the memory area that you want to use. This is all internal for the kernel. Uh, examples of this, actually I, I made it so that the, the, mem, uh, the, MI, the MMIO was actually mappable. And I mapped it so I could use it internally. And I used the TTM layer to do that. You will find also for the frame buffer em emulation, you will need to use this function to memory map so you, the frame buffer console can write to it. Now that's the TTM layer. Um, do you have any questions? Yes? Yes. There's a TTM bo underscore bo underscore type underscore user. And there's actually a function in TTM underscore T, uh, TT M dot C that does this for you. It, actually, no one has actually tried to use it, and recently I tried to use it, but I found there was one little problem that I need to report about it. It only writes one direction right now. 
It would be nice to be able to download it, but uh, you can't write to it. I mean, you, yeah. It only goes in one direction. Okay, and I will try to implement that soon. All right, so now this is the Intel solution that was developed. Um, it can be used completely, in, it does not depend on TTM in any way. In fact, the Intel driver does not use TTM. Um, and uh, as I was saying before, it uses a handle which behaves like a file descriptor. It uses the classic Unix model. You can do all the behaviors like you normally do. Um, there is no universal gem creation routine. You can close it, you can memory map it, you, you, you can do um, sim links, but you cannot, there is no universal creation. The problem is graphics hardware is way too complicated. There are too many different, um, the tiling structures are different. Z buffers, stencil buffers, they're all different formats. Um, so that's, so there's no way you, for, we have the same issue, we had to develop our own. Um, they, now one of the interesting challenges that we discovered is when we were implementing this, because they are independent, um, in that struct DRM driver, there's an actually M, the memory map routine that you fill in for the, the file operations. Well, they both implement their own memory mapping routine, which don't play nicely together. E they expect either one or the other. So I had to do some a little magic uh, to make that work, but you can do it. And basically, I gemified the TTM mem map again. Uh, so that's how we got around that. You can see that in our, the C file ttm underscore gem dot C. And the nice way, the reason I could do that is because in the, the DRM driver structure, you actually have the ability to control the VM operations for the virtual memory. It has a, for the page fault, the VM, the VM open, VM close. It's, in TTM, those are defined, you can't set those. They're already predefined. So that was interesting. There's also hooks you have to implement the gem init object and gem init free object. Uh, init object was one of those really great ideas that they were gonna actually create things inside there, but nobody's ever used it for that. So it's an empty function, everybody's, nobody's ever tried to use it. And there's reasons because the way the, there's some code, the way the code is written to create to open a gem object, it doesn't fit quite nicely to, the code would have to be rearranged to properly use it. Now gem free object is quite used, and in our case, we free the TTM object that's located underneath it. Okay, now with all, now one of the greatest problems is with all these mappings is that a lot of people, what happened was they created the libdrm library, which is used by a lot of the, the drivers. You began, it was basically, it's a library to control the buffer management for the specific types of hardware. Well, it started getting extremely complicated and extremely crazy, and it started diverging everywhere. So what happened is a lot of people said, well, look, here. Okay, the tiling stuff is all, all over the map. So, but there are linear frame buffers out there, and a lot of embedded devices use still linear frame buffers. So. After a lot of arguing and stuff, they said, let's make a basic API that we could make it, so libdrm, and a, you could get an xorg driver up and going right away, once you have the kernel mode setting going. So this is basically a very basic API to handle a linear non-tiled buffer. Um, for us, and like most drivers, almost every driver you'll see, it's a wrapper around the gem layer. It also takes a handle from user space and it just passes it down to a gem object that's created. Um, you'll see in the, in the structure DRM driver, there's also hooks for DRM create and the, 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 to create it, also to free it, and also to do memory, memory map offsets. Because once you memory map it, that way you can control where in the memory map you want to write to it. Okay. So that's all the memory management system. Uh, actually, believe it or not, the memory management system, it's a more complicated API, but it's easier to write, to develop, because it's very well defined. 
And the other thing is, is if you screw it up, it doesn't give you the same result when you do kernel mode setting, which is just a blank screen. No matter what you do wrong, it gives you a blank screen. Um, it's one of the most difficult things to actually debug. Now, this was one of the controversial things when it came in, and the reason this was developed was the frame buffer layer, it was, was built around the idea of a simple VGA monitor just hooked to your display. Well, that's changed drastically. There are lots of things you can control and manipulate. So, so they developed this API, and now the, currently there are three drivers that use, use this API, the Intel, the Radeon, and the, and the Nauvoo driver use this. Um, we are implementing it. It's partially implemented. I'm still debugging it. And basically, we have, you have to work the top structure is the struct mode config. And that's also located inside your DRM driver structure. That lists all your device co components, everything. Your encoders, your, your connectors, your CRTCs, everything. It also has a frame buffer create API, which actually now there's frame buffer create two API just coming out. Dealing with, that allows you to um, create, add a source. You memory allocate for a gem object, and then at this point, you actually have to bind it to something, this memory. This allows the ability to clone your display, so you can do mirroring. So you have this frame buffer structure, and it goes to your display one and your display two, or you can create, or you can even move it around. You can detach it and attach it to another display, so you can do screen migration. You can do all kinds of things like that. The other thing it has to handle the structure is the, it pulls for changes. So if your plug falls out and you plug it back in, it will know that you plugged it back in. If you put a new monitor in, it will know it has to change the resolution on the fly. It actually does this. The other nice thing it does is it actually sends user land events as well. And it'll tell it, look, the, the monitor has changed. Do not believe anything you have. So it'll know to update the software. Now, of course, in all these structures, you have three components that define the screen in this model. Um, you have the, your DRM CRTC, which represents your CRT controller types, which nowadays applies to all types of displays, but it's your traditional, what would control the frequency going to your monitor. It also controls a few other universal functionalities, which we'll go over. We also have the DRM encoder. Uh, it is the encoder it handles the signal going to the display. It has to, the display has to, it has to be encoded. Usually the traditional thing is the DAC. In the traditional VGA monitor, you had your, it had to go to digital to analog. You had to convert it. Another good example is HDMI. It's encrypted. So you, you should really encrypt the screen, uh, stream going into the, to the display. And your DRM connector is actually your display itself. And usually that information comes from the I2C bus. So we're gonna look at the CRTC, which is, this is the, this is universal to all types of displays. Um, things that are handled by all, um, all, display, all displays is color map handling, usually gamma sets. Um, for modern displays, in the old days, it was the, you could program the co color maps and pseudo colors. Cursor handling, it doesn't matter if you have a digital display or a CRT, you're gonna have cursors. You're gonna move it around, and you're gonna turn them on and off. Um, you also have the dis uh, destroy function, of course. When you create this class, you have to clean up after yourself. And, uh, and of course, there's the set config function. Now, the set config is what actually programs the frequencies to go to your display. Um, so we, like a lot of drivers, a lot of code was written such that you could use a function that calls a lot of other functions to share code. And for, in the case of DR, the DRI API, it's the, the DRM CRTC helper set config. You will see the concept in the KMS layer is you'll have these structures like DRM, CRT, 
and then you'll have DRM CRT helpers, which are these hooks to supposedly to make your life easier, but it gives you mi more fine grain control. And you'll see that this function, this is a good example, is this is, quote, a generic function, but it actually uses the CRT helper function. So what are these helper functions? In the previous slide, we saw that you could do things like the color map, but here we can actually load the lookup table, which refreshes the entire color map. The previous function could change specific colors. This one actually reloads it. For example, when you actually go to, a lot of times a classic example is when you, when you power down your display for hibernation, you're gonna, a lot of times some empty the color map. You have to reset the color map. Your classic DPMS functions, you wanna power it up and power it down. Um, you also, those are the classic functions. Now the other thing, of course, the CRT does all the mode settings. So you have the mode fix up function. Now the thing is, is because you have a nice monitor doesn't mean your video card's gonna support it. That's just the reality. If you have especially older video cards, there are now monitors out there that are 4,000 pixels. Some video cards are not gonna like that. So that function actually picks that up and says, wow, this monitor is too good for me. Or it could be the opposite. The monitor could be too low of quality, so it won't pick it up. Um, we also have the set base function, and that's the one where you tell where in the memory, what memory region you wanna use to write to to display your system. So that's your basic scrolling pan function. You also have mode prepare. You, this, these functions, mode prepare, mode commit, mode set, if anyone's ever familiar with X org driver writing, you will see these functions in, the, in their XFX86 CRT functions structure. So they just basically took it out and threw it in here. So the prepare structure actually sets up the graphics state for mode setting. So before you video mode, you change your video mode, there are certain things you gotta do. Um, a good example of that is you need to stop your video, uh, the video blanking interrupts. You don't want to, you don't care about that during that time. Uh, also, the other thing you wanna do which most driver writers do, is they power down their screen. You don't wanna see your screen scribbled for a few seconds. So you turn off your screen. Uh, the commit function is the opposite. It actually resets, for example, the video blanking interrupts, and it will actually reset your screen and turn it back on. So those are the things you wanna do, so this way it doesn't blind you, or you don't have a Pokemon seizure. Now, mode set is a, the mode set is actually what does the real work. It's the engine that displays it. It sets the, the PLL, it sets the clock, and it does all the program, it does all the frequency stuff. So it handles all that. Now this code is extracted out, so you'll notice it doesn't handle things like what is the bits per pixel and things like that. These things can be changed without modifying the entire graphics engine. That's why it's sorted that way. Now, you can do all that, but actually you have to know how to talk to the display. Even with the frequencies coming in, the displays handle those frequencies differently. Good example is LCD. You can set a mode on it. It has a, LCDs normally have a fixed resolution. So what you do is you have to scale it up. Those are the kind of things you have to do when you set it up. So the encoder tells you how to talk to the display. So, the function, the, the, actually the uh, DRM encoder is actually pretty simple. It has two functions, it has the reset functions. That's, like it says, that's when things go really bad, you reset your system. And destroy is of course when you're done using it. Now, like all, like I, as I pointed out earlier, K, KMS is lots of helpers. And again, we have helpers here, in this case. And the, and here we have, again, power management. As you'll see, power management's handled at various levels because it's handled a little differently. So when you, when you actually power down your monitor, it actually goes through these layers. It's kind of like the, and that's because, well, as we all know, GPUs are in graphics cards are the most complex instruments today. 
it, when we power down our systems, we power down our hard drives and that, you, you go through the same routine on a graphics card, just with different components. So you have that, and also you have your mode fix up. Again, it's the same issue. Um, your graphics card might be able to program the mode, but the signal going out might not like it. Classic examples of that, inter interlace. Um, it might not support that. Or the classic one, I don't know if any of you have encountered that, a lot of HDTVs have, do not handle overscan the same way. Yeah, you've, okay, you've seen that. <laughs> yeah, so these are things you have to actually catch in the encoder and say, whoa, we don't handle the overscan very well on the HDTV. So we're gonna have to try to behave properly. So now in the function, just like the other one, you have the prepare, commit, and mode set, which is the same. Now in the encoders, mode set is very specific to what it is. Um, and the, it's for digital, because the way you program an analog port and a digital port is very different. So the mode set handles those intricacies. Now, and commit is of course what, what you do after you're done, and prepare is of course what you do before you do, so you set the hardware state in such that it can handle what's about to occur. Because in, well today it's a little bit better, but I remember in the old days, sometimes you had to degauss your sun monitors if you did it wrong. Okay, the, and then the final structure is the actual display itself. Um, this is a little tricky because some monitors are smart, some monitors are impaired, and then some monitors don't talk to you. Um, your classic is embedded devices. You don't know what the display really is or what it can really support, so you have to hard code it. Some use EDD, EDID uh, blocks to tell you what the monitor supports. Sometimes it's, it tells you the truth, sometimes it lies to you. So you actually have to handle all that stuff here. So in the connector format, you have, again, you have your state management. And here, with connectors, you can actually save the state, restore the state, or reset the state. So if your monitor gets really jammed, you can reinitialize it. Of course, you have your classic destroy function, which cleans it up after you unplug it. And then when you plug it back in, you can recreate it. Um, and you have your DPMS, of course, for power management. You actually want to turn off your screen. Uh, and there's, of course, the infamous detect. Are we there? So you want to know, actually, is something attached? Now, the thing is, a lot of hardware cards, like this laptop, has an HDMI port, but I don't have an HDMI monitor plugged in. So it actually has, this routine goes, are you there? Well, if it's not there, it doesn't do anything. Now, if it is there, it fills up the modes. So it goes through and it says, oh, this is what it displays. And it will tell you. Now, usually monitors will tell you with that now, um, what modes are supported. And for embedded platforms, you actually got to hard code that in there and fill it. So when you say fill modes, it gets it. Now, set properties is the properties that the monitor ha handles. Every monitor is different. DVI, a good example is think of DVI analog, DVI-D. Very similar, but very, very different, how they handle things. So these are specific properties that these monitors will have. HDMI, for example, it's a digital system like DVI, but it supports audio over the channel. You can send audio signals as well as video signals over. So these are the things you can actually see as properties. And of course, there's the force option. That one is, that's when you take a hammer to it, when all else fails. That, that's, it, it, that's the one it will select. Usually, sometimes monitors, you can, say you have a monitor, you have one display, and you can plug in the analog and the digital. It'll pick one, and you can only see one at a time. So which one do you wanna see? That's what that, that will tell you. It'll have, it'll get, you can control the preference. And of course, we have helpers again. We have the ability to get the modes, and that one will actually retrieve it. It's very similar to fill modes, actually. Actually, f helpers, of course, is called inside fill modes. So the, the reason for get modes, it might seem similar to fill modes, but fill modes are usually implemented such that they call get modes. Now you're probably saying, why not just have one function? 
The reason why is they say for things like the LVDS, the embedded display, sometimes they do have EDDs. Sometimes they're not hooked up. So what happens is you can have the same hardware on a vendor and the driver will go and it'll try the EDD and it'll say, oh, okay, I've got modes. But then on some platforms, it'll not be hooked up and it'll say, oh, I'm not getting anything. So, or it could be busted, so then it'll have to fill in modes in another way. So that's why you do that, that's why that's handled. And best encoder, and that tells you which signal do you prefer um, to send over. Like I said, you can actually have multiple displays. We have these, you see these wires that are split and you can plug in your analog and your digital. You can pick which one you want. What is the best encoder for that, for connected to the, connect, to the connectors? Digital signals, you can choose between DVI and HDMI. Which one would you rather have? So that's all the memory management, and, that's all, and that is also all the essence of mode setting. The mo uh, now we're going to the traditional functionality of the drivers. This is stuff that pre-KMS drivers have done, and the, one of the most important functionalities is IRQ handling, actually. And this is actually what drove the use of KMS, actually, is because IRQ handling is very painful to go to user land. You have a severe penalty cost, which you just cannot handle in graphics drivers. So this entire system was developed to handle this kind of stuff, including also the issue with SMP systems. So for your regular driver, there's a wrapper the DRM layer provides, it's DRM IRQ. You can uninstall or install it. The routines are broken up. You can, uh, you can pr there's a pre-install, and that's to configure your hardware. Usually you have to program some register and say, use this IRQ, don't use this IRQ, so usually a bit mask. And IRQ uninstall is the same, it is the opposite. That's when you want to disable it. Usually it's on a module loading and unloading, but sometimes you actually want to turn off IRQs if you get an IRQ storm or things like that. So your system goes funky. Now there's also the post install, which handles the state and setting up structures. It's a hook for after you get an IRQ request. If anyone's done kernel driver development, there's a function in the Linux kernel that actually requests it. I, usually um, post install deals with the new stuff like MSI, and you can register handles with it and stuff. And the reason is because we're coming to the point where IRQs are being shared between the ACPI layer and the tr graphics drivers, so it's now it's getting really complicated. So now you have to manage the state, make sure it doesn't get out of sync. You can see that with light, especially with backlight issues. There's three different ways you can set your backlight now. And you have to make them all keep together. Oh, am I running over time? Okay, thank you. Okay, and of course, video blanking. Video blanking is, of course, to prevent things like shearing on your screen. Um, this has a basic function. It's pretty easy to do this. This is also a pre-KMS feature. Um, the behavior of it is a little changed due to KMS because before you had to specify what your CRT was by an index and now you can do more. And the thing is, is when you know internally the CRT functionality, you actually know what the frequencies are. So without knowing what the CRT is, with the blanking, you kind of didn't know what the real timing was. And the, especially nowadays with hot plug and you can switch your monitors out, how long is it gonna be to the syncing next time? You don't know. So the API on the surface looks similar, but then there was enhancements done to deal with these things with hot plug and, and modern monitors. So the basic functionality was to enable it, to disable it, there is a hook for to get the video blank counter. That's where, how many have occurred? The other thing is the time stamp. Um, some people actually want to know when the video blanking happens, because sometimes it takes a while to get to you. Even if you, ex even under the best circumstance, your machine's under load, um, you're gonna, say you're running Blender or something, and it's processing and creating the scene while it's displaying it, you might lose and get out of sync. And then it's up to the user application. Do I honor this sync? So
So, and in the KMS version, you can use the CRT frequency settings to calculate what is the real timestamp. So it gets a better uh, timestamp. And there's an actual function that they provide that does a lot of the math for you, so you don't have to twiddle your thumbs and reinvent the wheel. That's DRM calc, V blank stamp from scan outpost. Yeah, I know, it's really long. Um, so, as I said, KMS had to do more, actually, now. Because now you do things like power management. You change your video mode. So you actually have to handle the video blanking uh, state during those things. Because now it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're halfway through a sync when you change your video mode. You're going to have to deal with that. Or you can actually sync it to the video mode, the, the video blanking. There are different things you can do. You also have functions put and get. If any, everybody loves those terms. You can actually control the ownership of those IRQs, of the video, of the V blank count. Um, there's a way to do referencing on it because you could have a horde of people wanting to know what is the video, what's, what state is the video blanking in. So you have to deal with who, who's most important to deal with it. If you have 100 uh, OpenGL apps who want to sync up to share, somebody's got to come first, and somebody's going to come last. Okay. Uh, and of course, when you shut it down, you have the video blank off. That will flush your queue, so they'll all get to trample out. And then it'll shut it down. And of course, you have your V blank handle. That's your, what you do. That's, um, that's a way uh, that's a way to handle the KMS layer within the video in the IRQ bottom handler. It does a lot of bookkeeping for you, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And that's it. Any questions? I know it was a lot to digest. It's a very complicated API. Uh, complicated API. But I hope this gives you an idea how to do this. So. Um, I'm hoping that embedded developers can move to this API and have some idea how to do it. Thank you. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. OS, an OS that works the way that you do across all your devices. HP Slate and WebOS. HP.